There's one thing that we wanted to make sure you all know about, and so I would like to invite Aaron Etra to come up. Aaron? I don't see him. Okay. <laughs> to to uh, speak with us for just five minutes uh, about, uh, uh, he is the co-chair, one of the two co-chairs of the Council of Organizations, and he's uh, very involved in helping to organize uh, the UN Department of Public Information NGO conference uh, later this summer. So he's going to let us know a little bit about. And Mel, again, is our timekeeper. Right. <laughs> uh, I think we heard this morning and uh, yesterday that we have an extraordinary opportunity, literally once in a lifetime. Uh, the MDGs were adopted in 2000. The end of the post-2015 sustainable development is 2030. So now we have this, this opportunity in August of this year, the 27th to the 29th to be uh, specific, for us to come up with an action agenda by civil society. All the consultations we've been involved in are leading to it. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to interact with our fellow NGOs, fellow civil society from around the world in New York from the 27th to the 29th. UNA USA can have as many of us represent uh, the NGO, represent us as we want to, to attend. So it's totally open. And I really, really strongly urge everybody to sign up. In addition to signing up to attend, we have another opportunity mm -hmm. to take two tablespoons of, of soil, our local soil, wherever that might be, put it in two plastic bags, bring it with us to New York to be analyzed to the potential for antibiotics in that soil, mm. to deal with drug-resistance antibiotics, which is the scourge of infectious diseases coming back to haunt the planet, the opportunity for public-private partnering, the opportunity to make a direct contribution to the sustainable development post-2015. That's what this is all about. Now, Chris and Laura, I think, will circulate to us the, the specific information as to how to accumulate the soil, uh, how, to, how to register for the conference, and all of those things. But I really, really suggest to each and every one of you, each and every one of us, to be part of that extraordinary opportunity to present to the United Nations an agenda for post-2015 from us, from civil society. Date and place again. Date and place is 27th, 29th. The location is a, is a small town called New York. <laughs> so please, please do. Uh, you can even take the spoons from today home with you and put the two <laughs> tablespoons of soil in your plastic bag. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well Thank you. Uh, I think this may be my last chance to say something, and, I, and I've been meaning to say it all, uh, the, all conference, and that is that people have been coming up to me and uh, telling me how fabulous this annual meeting is. And I want to, um, you to know that uh, there are a lot of people who put this together, not only Chris and his extraordinary staff, but there was a planning committee, and I wonder if the people who were on the planning committee, it was a coordinating committee of the steering committee and a few other people, if you could stand and share this praise, because you help put this together. Yay team. And now, Chris Watley. Well, I have the pleasure of, of introducing Ambassador Pickering. And for most of you, you know the ambassador quite well. He's been a leader in UNA from before it became part of the UN Foundation, and very generously throughout that transition and throughout the last three years has been a tremendous leader um, for the, the, the growth and vitality of the United Nations Association. But since we've got some younger members too, which is one of the great successes of our association, who might not remember back to 1989 when he became ambassador to the, uh, to the United Nations, when the Cold War was coming to a close and Former Soviet republics were being welcomed into the UN system. The first Gulf War unfolds, and uh, a series of resolutions authorized the use of force that ultimately uh, allowed for 
the reversal of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Since that's not a memory for some of you, I wanted to mention that history. But also, he's one of the greatest public diplomats of his generation, a professional diplomat. Uh, so by the time uh, he finished his, his service with the State Department, he had covered seven other countries as ambassador, holding the flag of the United States as ambassador. So that means, you know, he was the ambassador to Russia and Israel and India and El Salvador and Nigeria and Jordan. Uh, so not only does he have that experience as our diplomat to the UN itself, to that institution we exist to support, but he has a, he was a ambassador to a statistically relevant subset of the 193 member states of the UN system. So we could have no better leader um, of our strategy council, no better speaker today, and with that, Ambassador Pickering. Thank you, Chris, very much. And it's a pleasure to be back with all of you. It's a little bit like old home week, seeing so many UNA people I've known and met and talked to and who've suffered through my speeches over the years. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a special pleasure to be here. And thank you, Chris, for your very warm and fine introduction, although it does make me a little bit like the man who really couldn't hold a job, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, and it's a delight to be in the room with so many wonderful, distinguished people, all of them moving their mouths in total silence. <laughs> what a great effect. I'm going to do three things today, if I can, fairly briefly, and then hopefully open it up for your questions. I know there are a lot out there, and I'm anxious to hear them. I want to talk a little bit about the United Nations and how it's involved and not involved or might become involved in three major crises that we have now going on around the world in our foreign affairs. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Russia and Ukraine, about Syria, and about Iran. And I think that's probably enough to fill the bill, but there are many more others behind. Uh, and then I want to say a, a little bit about the continuing importance of the United Nations, which ought to be self-evident on the basis of the first part of my talk, and then finally, uh, the phenomenal growth of the organization and what it's doing. And uh, Chris has already alluded to the fact that we have now gone through rejuvenation. Uh, none of you 60 or 70 year olds have gotten any younger, but your colleagues have, and our average age has certainly taken a plummet exactly where it ought to be, and I'm so grateful. But I'll say a few words about that at the end. Uh, to begin, the state of the world uh, is not very good. Uh, and at times like this, we look at the organization that we support as having to play a significant role. And it's in the area of peace and security and in the Security Council where that often uh, becomes the most important feature of the landscape. Uh, those of you who are lucky enough to attend the peacekeeping session will understand how important the 120,000 or so peacekeepers are. It's something of a national chagrin to me that we're able to muster just slightly under 50 to participate in that large group. We ought to be there a little more vigorously. But I can remember back in the Clinton administration when I was ambassador in New York, uh, having to beat my head against the wall to get four people to go to Sierra Leone. And while I got unflagging commitment, it took no action. And no action was ever taken on that commitment, even though clearly we should have been there. Uh, we are looking um, at a world that's going through rapid change. Uh, and I wish we could all say very clearly where we see it going, but that's not certainly the answer. But we know, in fact, that the United Nations is there to try to keep it from going off the rails, if I could put it that way. Uh, and we are now in the midst of what I think is the beginning of the second phase of Mr. Putin's, if I could put it diplomatically, outreach uh, <laughs> into the world. Uh, and we clearly, I think, have seen uh, some withdrawal, but we don't know what, whether, in fact, that is merely a tactical move or whether that represents something more significant. It is clear to me, having spent some time in Russia, 
and having seen and spoken with Mr. Putin from time to time, uh, that we can analyze his goals at the present time uh, in four major areas. I think in one area, he's inherited a goal that the old Soviet Union used to share. They want to be on the top podium with the top countries of the world, certainly with us, and now quite clearly with China. And they want to be in the decision-making nexus that deals with the world's principal problems and play a role, put it this way, in the answers to those problems. And obviously, they want to do this for their own national reasons. They ought to do this, obviously, to promote and protect their own national interests, something that all countries who play in that particular sandbox are doing, the United States and China. We need, obviously, uh, to find new ways to do this. Uh, whether he deserves admission or not uh, is a different story. Uh, he is seeking admission to doing that. Uh, during the days in which we had to deal with the Soviet Union on a number of subjects, it, it was often a very important point of U.S. leverage uh, to get the Soviet Union to do some of the things that we felt they ought to do, and we had a very long list, uh, to tell them, in fact, that they could be on the podium uh, with us at the end if they were prepared to support a set of ideas consistent, obviously, with our interests in the region and consistently consistent with, obviously, our commitment to the UN Charter and where those issues were going. Uh, secondly, Mr. Putin would like a sphere of influence in the area around Russia, something that I like to call the Monroski Doctrine. <laughs> It has not escaped his own historical recollection, wherever that might be and however faulted that might be, that we too, but for a different reason, advocated beginning in the middle of the 1820s uh, that kind of approach. We clearly wanted to prevent the recolonization of the hemisphere by the European states, principally Spain. Uh, that was losing colonies year after year. Uh, Mr. Putin wants to prevent what I would call the emergence of outside influence in countries alongside Russia. Uh, not perhaps their recolonization, and in fact, he may be interested in some recolonization on his own in this sphere. And so the Monroski Doctrine and the Monroe Doctrine are not exact parallels. But it is nevertheless clear that one of the irritants that Mr. Putin feels is that in Kosovo, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, we did a number of things in which he now tells his folks he's using our copybook, in effect, uh, to promote his own interests, regardless of the limitations. And he and his uh, acolytes are suggesting a new definition of the world in some ways or perhaps a redefinition. And we want to consider that very, very carefully because we have the Charter, we have the United Nations, we have a system that works, we have a set of international laws in which Russia and the Soviet Union participated in making, among the most important of which were the Helsinki Acts and the OSCE, and indeed much of what governs good behavior and good sense today. And so that will be an enormously important question as we go ahead. Uh, whether we achieve that by diplomatic conference or whether we achieve that by the old method of carborundum, uh, turning the wheel while it wears down the knife, if I could put it that way, will be interesting to see. The third thing that uh, Mr. Putin is doing is that he's exploiting Russian nationalism, in large measure, I think, to pull the country together. He came to power 15 years ago with the sense that Mr. Yeltsin had allowed the country to fray, to pull apart. Uh, there were too many uh, governors running too many provinces with their own economic ideas. Uh, and so he wants to pull that together. And the fourth thing is a kind of offshoot of that. Whenever his popularity ratings gets low, he knows that it's a surefire cure for that popularity problem uh, to beat the hell out of the United States. Uh, he can always bring people along with that, regardless of what's going on. 
And to some extent, that's a real fault, to put it this way, in communications. Uh, and short-term communications has been a major effort of his in seeing how and in what way he can influence Ukraine. Ukraine has been a serious problem because under President Yanukovych, he pretty much ran the place in its principal efforts uh, and lost that overnight, uh, reposted with the taking of Crimea, uh, and has in fact encouraged, as we know, uh, separatists in eastern Ukraine, perhaps so much so uh, that he will find it impossible to deliver or very difficult to deliver on the ceasefire that the president has called for and that ought to come next in the set of issues that have to be dealt with. A way forward in this particular issue, in my view, comes from the principal problem that led uh, to the expulsion of Yanukovych, to the change in government, uh, to the unrest in the country across the board, including those attached to Ukraine as an independent country and those attached to Russia, the failure of the Ukrainian economy and the failure of the Ukrainian government to provide principally for the economic answers. Here's an opportunity for the rest of the world, an opportunity for the Europeans, for us, and for the Russians, if they're really prepared to deal with the Ukraine on a basis that it will not provide a threat to them, uh, but they will no longer have an absolute right to exercise control over it. Uh, there is not yet a large United Nations role. There is a very significant, U, uh, very significant European role and a very significant role by the uh, OSCE, which I just mentioned, in providing election observers. And there will be another election in Ukraine probably this year for a parliament. And so there are opportunities ahead, I believe, uh, not only in the reconstitution of the Ukrainian government under President Poroshenko, but also uh, the opportunity, I hope, to bring Mr. Putin along rather than necessarily continue uh, to flaunt uh, his ability at deception, at cyber warfare, at information, and the use of special forces uh, to try to have his way in the Ukraine. Several pieces of good news. It has not taken very well. Large numbers of people are not flocking to the Russian banner, which I think is an important lesson. Secondly, he has, I think, very carefully uh, omitted to pay attention to Russia's, Russia's extreme strategic vulnerability, uh, which is that it is a monocrop country so heavily dependent on oil and gas exports uh, that in the end, uh, that kind of leverage could be very significant. We will have to persuade our European friends and help them uh, with the Arab world, with Africa, with Latin America, and indeed maybe with some of our own shale gas uh, over the next year or two to develop the kind of less dependence that will make things, I think, a lot more possible. It's absolutely fascinating that experts tell me that the China $400 billion deal, when finally put into effect, will represent only 10% of China's oil and gas needs. If, in fact, you owe the bank a thousand bucks, it's a real problem. If you owe them 10 million, it's their problem. <laughs> so we have to look around, obviously, at cutting dependence. And maybe that can help work here. I think he sees that in the offing. And my view is he isn't prepared for and does not want a conflict over Ukraine. Uh, he will, in the end, be subject to leverage, which can push. Uh, the Russian economy is headed downward very rapidly. Very large amounts of capital flight, somewhere between six trillion and two hundred billion dollars, depending upon whose statistics you like. Uh, a real move in the Russian uh, ruble exchange rate against Russia, um, and indeed very little foreign direct investment. Would you put money in Russia under current circumstances? <laughs> I certainly wouldn't. But that's the kind of situation we face there. Syria is a huge and, in my view, very devastating problem. And for reasons I cannot fathom, uh, we as a community uh, and most of the people around the world are prepared to sit and watch as six to 7,000 deaths, mostly of innocent people, occur monthly in Syria. The figures the UN has stopped giving because it doesn't believe 
it can be reliable any longer, but they're certainly north of 150,000 deaths. Syria is, in fact, in the kind of turmoil where I believe no amount of additional violence is likely to make a serious difference in the outcome except to kill more people. It's a country which is having a very malign influence in the region. It's a country in which outside players are, in fact, having their own civil war inside Syria, and in many cases promoting the radicalization of that civil war. Uh, and it is extremely destabilizing, particularly to small neighbors like Lebanon and Jordan. If I've described a calamity, then I've been successful. It's a calamity that the UN has had a role in from the beginning. Former Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, led a political effort to attempt uh, to get a series of agreements in Geneva a year and a half ago. Uh, Lakhdar Brahimi has been struggling in the trenches, has now left. The Secretary General will need to find a new gentleman of metal, of commitment, of distinction uh, to be able to pick this up. The truth is that there's no willingness yet on any of the players uh, to understand uh, that their favorite hopes can only be achieved at least in part at the conference table and not on the battlefield. And that's an equation that we have to, in my view, do everything we can to promote. Now, secondly, the UN will be there in the person of the Secretary General's special representative. It will require somebody who can work with the Syrian parties, in itself a tremendous challenge. It will require working with the outside parties, all of whom have interests in Syria, but not all of whom are in accord. It will require working with a formula which I think is real, which is that President Assad will have to be in at the beginning of the politics and out at the end. And that to some extent, uh, we must consider Iran as important. And while Iran has so far been out at the beginning, to have an end, I believe Iran must be in. And it will, be require, it will require convincing the Russians, who are now otherwise distracted, as I told you, uh, that this is an important area for stability. And indeed, if they wish to maintain some influence in the region, rather than shredding Syria, they have to be there to help put it together. And that's extremely important. We are not anywhere near that yet, but the tragedy is as people die, and people are certain that a political result is absolutely necessary, we have not yet been able to find the formulas. One formula that lurks in the background is important, a ceasefire. Another is that the four principal outside countries who are involved, Russia, the United States, Iran and Saudi Arabia all agree, interestingly enough, that violent Sunni terrorism is a, an enemy to their interests. We need to be able to build on that. We need to be able to build on an approach which can either negotiate some kind of technocratic transitional government or is prepared in one way or another uh, to bring to the Syrian people the opportunity to choose, probably through some kind of constituent assembly their future. We are not there yet. There are a number of informal ceasefires that exist in Syria now uh, between both parties uh, because they know and understand in whatever region they're contending that they have nothing but killing left to do and neither benefits from that kind of abject behavior. So it is there, it is waiting. We hope the Secretary General will soon choose somebody who is a cross between the Messiah <laughs> and perhaps, um, I won't say what else. <laughs> One of the great Italian managers 
of the past, with all respect to Jeff Laurenti. <laughs> <laughs> to make this happen. <laughs> Iran is a little bit better news. Uh, we are now six weeks away from the deadline for a comprehensive agreement. For the first three months, uh, like <coughs> the man who jumped out of the Empire State Building going past the 26th floor, were simply splendid. Uh, we're now in the hard work. And yesterday, Bill Burns uh, went to Geneva to have talks today and tomorrow, along with the EU and the Iranians, in a recreation in a different fashion of the confidential bilateral discussions, which were extremely important in leading to the agreement that was reached in November, the joint uh, plan of action. I won't go over that in detail. Uh, the comprehensive agreement is now between a rock and a hard place for the following reasons. Uh, Iran and the others are some severe distance apart on enrichment of uranium, how much, how many centrifuges, what kind of output they should have. Uh, the Iranians believe that they should be prepared to have all of the capability necessary to provide fuel for a very large reactor program, uh, which at the moment they cannot afford and which they have not contracted for. Um, the others on the other side of the table, the P5 plus one, uh, believe that inter enrichment sufficient uh, for the reactors that Iran has, which are making medical isotopes, and perhaps a little more would be fine. Uh, the distance between them is defined in the P5 plus one by a deep concern that with too many centrifuges, Iran will have the opportunity rapidly to break out to a nuclear weapon. There are other issues. I won't go into them in detail. There are, I believe, ways through these issues, uh, including uh, limitations on the number of centrifuges, perhaps based on if, as, and when Iran is really actually going to contract for and build large reactors, uh, they might then be supplemented or supported by outside fuel, maybe by a multinational fuel arrangement, which the Europeans introduced some years ago, where no one country has the entire technology under its control. Someone provides the plant. The others provide the centrifuges and so on as a way to guard against rapid breakout and build into the system uh, some stability. Uh, where the enriched material, once it is made, is translated into a form which cannot be readily upgraded uh, and where the inspection by the United Nations uh, continues to be uh, a major bulwark and firewall against breakout. Here the UN has played a very important role, particularly through the International Atomic Energy Agency. And indeed, one portion of the negotiations with Iran is being conducted by the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, to deal with the allegations that between 1998 and 2003, Iran had a program that looked very much like a military program. And to explain that program to the UN inspectors so that the UN inspectors, at a minimum, know what went on and can, with their future inspection recommendations, uh, be capable of taking that particular set of actions into account so it doesn't happen again. Uh, all of this is extremely interesting because many people see us potentially on the verge of a new relationship in the Middle East. Whether, in fact, an agreement will be made by the 20th of July or not, is that big $64 million question that is not yet answerable. Both parties, or the parties on both sides, I should say, seem committed to making that happen. And we'll have to wait and see whether they can get there. But they will not get there without the major input of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And that's very significant and very important. And they're a mainstay of being there for the long-term future for the Iran program. Those are a few thoughts. 
peacekeeping for three major crises. But there are many other issues. I always say to meetings like this, and you're getting tired of me hearing me say it, that the most significant part of the UN is the part we take totally for granted and never think about it. The delivery of international mail, the safety of flight of international aircraft, the operation of ships around the world, uh, weather exchange, trade, banking, uh, world health, uh, development, uh, population, 101 issues dealt with by the specialized agencies. Uh, we'd have to invent them, and indeed we did invent them, and put them in the UN system to make that all happen. Uh, and don't forget that they are unsung, almost unheard, but always with us, and that you really can't walk out of this building today uh, without one way or another bumping up, some, bumping up against something that they have put in place for our benefit of cooperation between countries and peoples all around the world. I think that the final point is we're in a bad patch because the Security Council can't agree. And we've been here before. And we need, clearly, uh, with our own efforts, to find ways outside the Security Council to enhance the propensity of the parties to understand that it remains a common, useful instrument uh, for both sides to come together around whatever can be done. And the good news is that despite Ukraine, my friends in the State Department continue to tell me that the Russian work on Iran continues to be positive, straightforward, and forward-leaning. And on Syria, I guess the news is they haven't gotten any worse. Uh, be thankful for small gifts. Uh, so there's a lot out there to do. I think finally, I'm particularly pleased and proud to know from Chris uh, that three years ago when the merger took place, there were 8,000 members of this organization. Right now, there are 19,000 plus. Yeah. Three years ago, we had 1,000, what, under 25s. Now there are 9,000 under 25s, 9,500. And if we had a vote today, they're a majority of the organization. And I'm delighted to hear it. I think it is extremely important for us to think about how we can double both sets of numbers in the next two or three years again. I think it's also important to believe that we must think about and continue to work on how the under 25s, with their aspirations, with their approaches to life, which are different. They are not chapter people necessarily, or they are young chapter people. They stay in touch in different ways, electronically, with all of the new facilities and services. How can we keep them with us at 35 and at 45 and at 55? That's the challenge now. So obviously, doubling the numbers, uh, but in, put it this way, uh, tripling the retention mm -hmm. is what we need to struggle for. I thank all of you for that. It could not be done without your help. It could not be done without the dynamic efforts that the leadership of this organization has made, that Chris and that many others whose names I will never know, but you will know, have been playing and pushing the, the organization ahead in the areas in which it's going. I'm delighted to be here, particularly delighted to be here, put it this way, on, on the back of the uptick wave. <laughs> and I will continue surfing with you. And thank you very much for it. I don't know whether anybody has any questions left. Obviously, I covered everything. <laughs> Please write down here, sir.
Use the microphone. They'll bring you a microphone. Right now. There it comes. Hi, I'm Andy uh, Yuan from East, East Bay Chapter. Um, so I was wondering, you, you posed the Syrian solution as uh, talks between the two parties, but it seems whoever wins, the Kurds in the north lose. So what kind of, what kind of solution would you have that would incorporate the Kurds in, into, in, into a possible solution? I think that you raise a very interesting and uh, I think very neuralgic question. Um, there is no doubt that the Kurdish population of the Middle East, I believe, if giving, given a free choice, probably would, all things being equal, want to choose to become an independent country. I don't know for a fact, but I suspect that's the case in Iran, in Iraq, Turkey, and in Syria. Uh, up until now, post-World War I divisions of the Ottoman Empire have kept that from happening. It is also, in my view, not an absolute necessity uh, that every ethnic group uh, around the world should always succeed in becoming independent, uh, particularly if, in fact, that represents small groups, that we must develop something that I think has been very important in the past. First, majority rule, but full respect for minority rights. And they have to be enshrined in law. And this is not something in that part of the world which is an easy, ordinary, everyday occurrence. It's hard in our own country in a lot of times. And you look around our country and there are places we're not doing so well. I think that secondly, we need to pick up from the European model something that is dragging now, which is a Europe of neighborhoods where, in fact, uh, national boundaries are there. Um, but they're there not to somehow inhibit, uh, destroy, or to obviate the possibilities of people across those boundaries forming alliances, relationships, engaging in trade, seeing each other, moving freely. And to some extent, Europe has done that. We have happily, at the moment of our independence, declared that. It took us 12 years uh, with a faulty, put it this way, constitution to overcome that. But that is one of the fundamentals of this country. Again, we have trouble making it work. Uh, our Native Americans are not necessarily uh, seeing that as something that's working to their advantage. But I think that we need to be thinking about a world not of a new plethora of small nation states and excessive nationalism, but one that can be built on cooperation. And it seems to me that's what the UN stands for. Obviously, it's an organization of member states. But increasingly, it should be an organization of peoples. It should be an organization of like-minded. It should be an organization that helps pull people together. It should be an organization that works to break down artificial barriers. Yes, down here. Joe Baxter, Connecticut. Wait for the mic. Particularly on uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, my question has to do with the Israeli Palestinian issue. Um, now that the U.S. process seems um, very slow and um, aware that there is a lot of uh, feeling about that issue here in the United States, uh, will the UN, um, can you imagine the UN Security Council stepping in? Or what do you imagine will be going as the next step in this process? Thank you very much for asking. I have to give Secretary Kerry high marks for going in uh, to a very messy and difficult situation when the common wisdom such as it is, was against doing that. But the long-term strategic vision that he shared with us, that it remains a major disruptor of the region and the world, is in my view still true today, despite, in fact, uh, the notion that that particular effort did not succeed. Um, I have long been a partisan of a framework for two simple reasons. One, a framework influenced by the United States could ho hopefully rule out 
all of the wild ideas on both sides that represent a triumph of aspirations over reality. And secondly, a framework could be for formulated in a way that would permit the parties to carry forward their negotiations where they themselves would have to make the major commitment uh, for the compromises that have to be accomplished within the framework. And so a framework, in my view, is a good step on the way forward. I hope that one or two things may happen. That the framework may be resuscitatable, I don't know. I was very pleased to see that the new technocratic government in Palestine has, in fact, been agreed to by the United States that it will deal with it. There are not members of Hamas, and there are not members of Al Fatah in that government. Uh, but it is a step forward, and I think it could be very useful. Uh, that Shimon Peres, who is responsible for nothing in, in Israel except representing his country, uh, met with Abu Mazen at the Vatican over the weekend. Uh, and there is no better way to start this process than ardent prayer, because it is very much needed. I think if our framework were to emerge at some point, uh, as something that could bring the parties together, I'd like nothing better. And I don't know that the framework is dead, but it is certainly somnolent at the present time. I think secondly, if it cannot emerge from the parties, I think it was very important for Secretary Kerry to say that he would like the parties to put in public their comments on the framework. I'd like to see those. Uh, I thought first that's a disaster. Why do you want to let them do that? There'll be nothing but you know, beating up on it. Uh, but to some extent, the parties will be the victims of their own excesses in this. And we should use that as a lever to help. I think finally, to get to the point of your question, I've always believed that if a framework is not acceptable on a reasonable basis by the parties in a reasonable time, we should take it to the Security Council just the way we took 242, uh, the long ago resolution on territory for peace. It would be, in effect, a next step in the direction of carrying out 242. And in a way, it would establish what I would call the ratchet principle in diplomacy. It will be hard to go back from if, in fact, it has the full support of the Security Council. Now, to be honest, the Security Council is, on this one, the United States. Everybody else, in my view, would go along with a reasonable set of framework principles, maybe with a few you know, wiggles here and there. Uh, but it's the United States that will have to take it on. And the United States has been very reluctant, particularly in election years, to put forward principles that they have a strong guarantee that Mr. Netanyahu will have exceptions to. And of course, that's Mr. Netanyahu's right. Uh, but it isn't necessarily a reason not to go forward. Uh, and we will have to look at that very carefully. Uh, but a country that is not prepared to take its own position into the Security Council is a country that needs to look at its own position again. <laughs> Let me see. Are there ladies who have? Yes, here we are, way here. Yes. Good to Thank see you, you Ambassador Thanks. Pickering, for your wonderful analysis and extraordinary remarks. You have enlightened us. I have a personal plea from our chapter, and I know UNA members would agree. The recent comments of George Wills in the June 4th article in the Washington Post, where he referred to the UN as an in inconsequential entity. Would it be possible for you to respond to that and write an open <laughs> yes. well, I mean, We're I, pleading with you. I, I can do it here. I can say that, obviously, uh, we have a great deal to do with making the Security Council good, bad, or ugly. Uh, not everything. Our friends in Russia and China have been foot draggers of significant proportion. And in that sense, George may be right. Um, I was there at a time when we were changing. Communism was falling and fell, uh, that we had a new attitude on the part of other people, uh, and that we wanted to deal with cases of aggression 
and see, in fact, whether the international community could push them back. Now, we have differences over that particular principle and how to do it. So I'm hopeful, despite the fact that it isn't an easy push, and Ambassador Power has her hands full, uh, but there's no reason at all why we shouldn't be there. I've given you three, uh, and I, I think there is every reason why, in fact, we should seek uh, to try to make, in a number of these cases, uh, the, the, what I would call the decent opinions of mankind through the Security Council, a part of the effort to nudge the world in the direction of a little more sane, a little more cooperative, and a little more sensible actions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you again for being here. And I just want to express that I do understand that the United States and the UN, of course, has an interest on the Middle East and uh, uh, more recently the Ukraine. But I, I keep wondering, being a native of Cuba, whatever happened to this little part of the world in the Western Hemisphere that's called Latin America, and more, more um, specifically, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, I'm talking about uh, Venezuela, but not only Venezuela. I mean, the dream that Castro had 55 years ago is actually becoming a fact. And it seems like both the United States and the UN, uh, I, I don't know, please enlighten us on that. Thank well, you. Well, I think you're perhaps more discouraged than I am. I think that Cuba is changing slowly. I think we can do more to promote change in Cuba. My own sense is that uh, the embargo is, in fact, the greatest reinforcement against change in Cuba. Uh, my view is My view is the more Americans they see in Cuba, the more contact we have person to person, the more open we are to have Cubans come here, uh, study here. Americans go to Cuba and study there. I have nothing uh, wrong with that. I think all of that makes a lot of sense. I think we can help build the Cuban economy uh, and help individual Cubans as opposed to necessarily the government, and I think there are useful ways to do it. So I think we've been too slow for too long in dealing with that issue, and my own sense it's coming. I cannot, however, believe that Bolivia, Venezuela, or Ecuador are the, uh, are the pathway for the future for the hemisphere, despite the fact that we have in one or two of them uh, new, put it this way, uh, outbreaks of, um, uh, I think unrealistic exuberance about where to go and how to move things. And I think that uh, Brazil, uh, Chile, uh, Peru, Colombia uh, show the way these days in ways that I hope will be useful. Uh, the UN and the hemisphere are playing a very significant role in Haiti. And I wish I could tell you I thought that that was all going to work out simply dandily, but it's not. It's a huge and heavy burden. I think that the hemisphere has wanted, uh, for good reason, uh, to be the arbiter of its own solutions in many questions. And as a result, we have looked very much at the Organization of American States rather than the UN as the primary arbiter in the hemisphere, and I think we should. I think we're going to need to find a way uh, to bring Cuba into the Organization of American States soon. I think there is too much unhappiness with our negative policy and not enough positive in our policy to push the question along. I say all of that knowing, in fact, that there are still segments of our society which are bitterly opposed. But in many cases, because uh, I followed the Cuban-American community as closely as one can from the outside, the younger generation has different ideas, and I think that's helping to move the United States. So I'd argue all of those points, and I would say that it is good for the hemisphere to continue to pull itself together. It is good for the hemisphere that it plays a very important role in the United Nations. It's also good for the hemisphere that the United Nations doesn't have to do a lot of peacekeeping in the hemisphere. Yes, sir, right here.
My question is looking at your era and mine, but rather addressing a, a large percentage of this group. A lot of the new generation young people are looking to be engaged, involved, and so forth in what's going forward in policies. Would you suggest possibilities for them to look at what they might consider in terms of employment or engagement or involvement or whatever because they are a part of our future? Thank you, and I think that that's right, and I'm pleased that so many are here. I think it goes without saying, if your ambition is to make a lot of money, probably you should look elsewhere. <laughs> but I think that it is important to note that there are now many ways to serve in this area. One has always been the U.S. government. And the U.S. government is always in need of the best and the brightest. And in many ways, even more today than perhaps at other times in the past. And increasingly, we're finding young people have lived abroad for a year at least. Uh, many of them know foreign languages. Uh, I was very honored that a program akin to the ROTC in the State Department was named for me. And three days ago, I spoke to the new class. And I found that two-thirds of that class already had great facility in foreign languages. And half of that group in languages that we would consider hard to know, Korean, uh, Vietnamese, Arabic, Chinese, Russian, and so on. So that's helpful. I think, secondly, there's a whole world out there of non-governmental organizations, many of them focused on particular problem areas, which are exciting and interesting. And in my view, well worth the time and indeed the commitment that people spend in dealing with them. And they have a lot of influence inside the government. It's very interesting. There is, in many ways, much more communication between those organizations than there was years ago. I can tell you, when I was ambassador in El Salvador, I heard from them daily. And we spoke often. And there was a huge amount of interest in what was going on in that little country. And for good and obvious reasons. And they played a tremendous role, both in helping the embassy understand what they were seeing, but also helping to understand what their aspirations were for U.S. policy and to enlighten us on how and in what way they could be put in place. And that was very helpful as well. I think that beyond that, uh, Capitol Hill, uh, despite what is the self-evident discord, should not be left in the hands of staff members who are only zealots for one extreme or the other of the political process. Now, to some extent, that depends on members. And to some extent, members depend on your elections. And to some extent, I can't change that. <laughs> but I think it's important to, to do that. I think that journalism and all of the new media play a huge role. And people should be thinking about how and in what way intelligent voices with serious ideas, wisely and articulately presented, can also make a real difference in our public understanding and indeed how and in what way issues get dealt with in this country. So there are just those four. You can go into academia. Uh, many of the great ideas for foreign policy have come in their own quiet, stealthy way uh, from academia. And we look at those and the think tanks as part of that as another area where people can play a role. So Washington is full of those kinds of opportunities. At the moment, it's tough time for getting a job. But my view is hang in, uh, stay with it. Uh, over a period of time, you too uh, can play a major role in this town. Yes, ma'am, right here. And thank you for all that you do, all that you've done. Uh, when answering the question of my colleague uh, from Florida, and my name is Eileen Davis Jerome from the Broward County chapter, I'm very concerned about Haiti. You mentioned Haiti briefly and your major concerns. And I understand uh, and read the day-to-day -day things which sometimes are um, conflicting reports. I'm concerned about your concerns 
and about possible solutions that you see for what is a horrendous situation. Thank you. Thank you. No, um, I wish I had some easy answers. Uh, Haiti has gone from a country with very bad governance uh, to a country devastated by an earthquake to a country now devastated by efforts to pick up the pieces which have been sporadic and half-hearted in many of their continuation despite the fact that after the earthquake uh, a great deal was done. I think a huge amount still remains to be done. Um, my own sense is that um, two or three things have to happen at one time in Haiti. Uh, Haitians, with the help now of the Brazilians and others, will gradually have to take control of law and order and the rule of law in Haiti. That there needs to be, and I don't see it yet on the horizon, uh, and I'm not saying this as a comment about the present government, but there needs to be some kind of leadership for reform and change. Uh, there needs to be, in my view, commitment at the grassroots uh, from outside, because the wherewithal is not in Haiti. Um, and that needs to be encouraged by the other two pieces that I just put on the table in some way that the synergies can result, rather than the absence of the other two's uh, uh, opportunities, the, the, the law and order and the leadership issue, uh, to, de to deteriorate and detract from uh, what countries from all around the world have been putting into Haiti and I hope we'll continue to do so. But those are, in my view, the three things that need to be done. A huge amount of economic commitment and technical assistance commitment, uh, but against the backdrop of both law and order and leadership. Yes, sir. You offered a view, uh, a global view. <clears throat> uh, I would like to ask you to further uh, paint us your, your uh, vision of the future especially with regards to two huge countries that has a role in the United Nations, China and that of India. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that your one point there is one of many. Um, I would say just this, because I have a whole hour and a half lecture on this one <laughs> that neither you nor I have time for today, happily. Uh, but I would say increasingly encouraging China uh, to play less of a reluctant role in the UN and more hopefully of a cooperating and working together role in the UN. And that doesn't mean we will always get China to agree with us. We ought to obviously find ways to have common agreement and it may not be where each of us start but we should try to end together. And I think that's important. I think that there are a huge number of major problem sets uh, one of those is poverty, growth, and development that needs to be addressed by the international community on a continuing basis, and Haiti is perhaps one very egregious example of what needs to be done there. I think that there is obviously environment and climate change and energy questions all linked together that need to be addressed. Uh, there are questions of weapons of mass destruction and what to do about them. Uh, there is the ferment and indeed the turmoil in the Middle East is a kind of special geographic case uh, that requires attention. And four years ago, I used to talk about the three I-word countries, Iran, Iraq, and Israel. Now the Middle East is unfortunately deeply complicated by many other problems, Egypt and Syria, uh, Yemen and Bahrain, just to name a few. Uh, and so that goes on. And I think finally, the big powers in the world are coming to realize that they have special responsibilities, not just special interests. And if we can get those responsibilities to the level of their special interests, uh, maybe we can make a little more progress in the Security Council and the UN. Yeah. I'm going to have to take one more because I have to yes. go get on an aeroplane. <laughs> So I haven't taken one on this side in a while, so raise your hand. Way in the back there, the lady right by the microphone. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Cora. I'm from the Iowa division. Yes. Uh, I might be one of those young people that everybody keeps talking about, but <laughs> my question is possibly a little bit backwards looking. People might be surprised to know that my hometown, Des Moines, has a pretty active exchange with El Salvador. A lot of people, a lot of my friends, including myself and my sister, have been to El Salvador. So I'm sure that you know better than I do that um, during the El Salvadoran Civil War, um, a US-backed military committed a lot of horrific human rights violations there. So my question is a sort of multi-level question. I know that our relations with El Salvador are better now, much better. Um, but how did that history affect your reception in El Salvador? And then also, what has the US done to address those human rights violations? And then a more general abstract question. In what situations and in what ways, if any, do you think that it is useful for the U.S. to address past global human rights violations that we've committed? Great, great question, and thank you. Too bad the young don't know how to ask questions. In my time, it was very clear that we had to deal with violence in El Salvador from whatever quarter it came. And there was significant death squad violence. There was significant violence uh, among the leadership in the country, as well as violence from those who were fighting against the leadership of the country. Uh, and in that particular sense, uh, we had a number of American human rights violations. Nuns were killed. Labor leaders were assassinated from the United States as well. And it was very important to try to clear those up as well as to encourage the Salvadorans uh, to deal with their own problems. We were partially successful, but not nearly enough. But what resulted was that in 1992, uh, I think, 91, uh, there was an agreement between the government and the guerrilla organizations for the future governance of the country. Uh, in many ways, uh, that agreement, I think, purposefully set aside the violence on both parts, uh, something that it would seek both retribution and trials for. And in very rare cases, they took place. That was their view of the best that they could achieve among themselves, even if it wasn't perfect from the point of view, uh, particularly for those who lost family members and indeed loved ones to the violence. Uh, but nevertheless, that was the view taken. South Africa proceeded in a different way, a wiser way in my view, and had it been understood, it might have been applied in El Salvador with the Truth Commission and indeed uh, the, the commitments that a Truth Commission requires. The full truth for an amnesty, uh, but the full truth obviously for trying to get an issue behind them. And the failure to be fully truthful left the individuals under an obligation uh, to be charged under the law. Uh, that is, I think, a very important step. Again, not totally satisfactory to everybody, but another way of perhaps more actively putting the question beside them. I am deeply disturbed in El Salvador that we have played in the post-conflict situation uh, for all good intentions a very malign role. We have sent back to El Salvador thousands of gang members from Los Angeles and Washington and every place in between. In a situation where the Salvadorans were not in a position to deal with them, where those gangs have now become a major criminal factor in destabilizing the country, and where they have been engaged, if I could put it this way, by the Mexican cartels to assist in the movement of drugs north. So this is a very difficult problem. It requires, obviously, very significant commitment on our part, which I don't think has been forthcoming, to assist the Salvadorans in dealing with the gang phenomenon and how and in what way they can obviously find a way to end this. In the meantime, it is growing. It is feeding on local unemployment and discontent and obviously is a seriously destabilizing factor in a country we spent all those years trying to move off on a different course. And so it's discouraging and upsetting. Uh, and I think that um, Americans at this stage 
should begin to ask the question, when we make big policy decisions, uh, do we examine all the consequences and do we fully understand them? Uh, or are we merely going to run down the road uh, with a short-term answer to many long-term problems? Uh, that's a, a question that I think could be asked about a lot of policies, including Iraq, in my view. Uh, and with that helpful word, I'll leave the podium. Thank you. If I may have your attention, um, before you begin your regional meetings and get to know your regional representatives a little better and deal with your issues and get to know each other, I want to remind you of the schedule change, and this is very important. Look at your schedule, and we have a, we have a change for today. If you enjoyed Ambassador Pickering's talk, you're going to love this schedule change. At 4.30, 4.30 today, it's not in your program. At 4.30 in this room, we will be hearing from Assistant Secretary General Robert Orr. He is the highest ranking U.S. employee in the United Nations system. He has been Assistant Secretary General since 2004. He is a deep and high ranking expert in the Secretary General's office. You will love hearing from Bob Orr. Please be in this room from 4.30 to 5.30 today. It's not in your calendar, so mark it down, please. Any other good words, Chris? We have a couple more logistics. First, please don't go anywhere in between now and Bob Orr, because we're going to be doing our advocacy training. We're marching towards tomorrow, so please stay with us.